Welcome back. Now we're driving through the heart of Rio de Ostras. Now, Rio de Ostras is a tourist town. It's a tourist town for mostly Brazilians. And it's a tourist town for Brazilians that are getting away, getting away from the major tourist town. Probably one of the biggest tourist towns in the world, which is Rio de Janeiro. And Rio de Janeiro may be the most, um, most well-known tourist city in the world. One thing that's interesting about Rio is it has beaches within minutes of driving. You're in the mountains. You, you have all types of diversity in the landscape. That's what makes it such a nice place. Of course, it's overcrowded, and that's the, the problem with it sometimes. And while a lot of people go to go to Brazil, go to Rio to to visit this famous or infamous place, most of the Brazilians live that live there. I don't know if most of them, but the majority of them that can, they get out of there. And several, most of the Brazilians that I know that live in Rio, they come to this town here. And this is a main tourist area. I've been here a few times, and the beaches are crowded, and I had no idea that the majority of people that were at these beaches were from other places. I thought it was probably the local population, but I came to find out just from speaking to people that live in Rio and other major cities, especially Rio, that this is where they go to. So that, so the tourists, so they escape the tourism to come there and go to Rio de Sostras in order to vacation. So if you look to the left and the right, you can see some businesses. We're not in the heart of the business district yet. We're the, I think this, these are more like shops that are here for the local population, maybe. And some of these are shops that might be related to construction or swimming pool installation, things like that. So that would definitely not be a tourist thing, but we're going to get into the heart of the town. In the heart, you have a lot of these small shops on the side of the road that are close to the beach. And they're places that within walking distance. So a lot of people go there to, to shop in the diverse type stores that are located in this area. And as you can see, that the traffic's bad. So that's going to be one of the problems here is we're going to see stop and go traffic. But in order for me to show everything we need to take the good with the bad now once we get out of real disasters the traffic will get better but as for now we'll have to deal with this relentless traffic and so as we're in this traffic i'm going to talk about some other things about brazilian culture now previous video i spoke about the confederados that were down here in Brazil. Now, when the confederados came down, 60,000 confederates came to Brazil. And it was, it was a really tough situation. And many of the, and about half, the, half of them went back. It was really, it was that tough down here. So the you know, person wrote a book about it. And I spoke about her, and I'm going to find out more information about her and maybe talk about her one day. But she wrote a book that was like Rest Confederate, and it was written in Portuguese. But her English, when she spoke English, it sounded like my grandmother, who was born in the 1880s or 1889, I believe, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. My dad was born in 1925. So my dad was the youngest of the family. So that means that, you know, so there, there was an age difference between that. And I was like the second youngest. Well, my dad was the second youngest. And I guess I was the second youngest. And my dad, you know, I was born when he was in his 50s. So, so for, you know, a lot of people, you might have, it's, it's rare, you know, I'm in a, maybe a rare situation. But a lot of people might have grandparents that were born in the 1950s. And 
of course, I'm at that age as well. But I have um, grand. My grandparents were born in the 1800s, so it's a it's a stretch of generations going back. Which I'm glad. But hearing her accent when I listened to her speak, it sounded like um, it sounded a little bit like the accent that my grandmother had. And it sounded like um, some of the old recordings like you might hear of people in the in the South back, you know, some of the very old recordings that we have. Because you can hear that slight little difference in the in the accent. You know, maybe the the Savannah draw perhaps that she had. But it was interesting to hear someone that had never lived in the United States to speak like that. And, of course, learning English is a difficult language. And when you learn English as a second language, you're usually going to have an accent unless you learned it at an early age. Or if you learn any language, you're usually going to have an accent accent unless you learned it as a child. So I speak Portuguese, but whenever I speak, everyone's going to stare at me. And then people are going to ask me, hey, where are you from? And it's a, it's a constant thing. So it, it sort of, it, it kind of gets old, but I don't mind it. Of course, it's better than, than no one ever speaking to me. So it's, it's a nice thing. I mean, people, people are inquisitive down here, and they like to ask questions. It's a little bit of a different culture. Like um, there's, there's been times where, you know, sometimes they, they don't have this um, – deal like we have you know we're told well you shouldn't ask people what they do for a living you shouldn't ask this question this question but there are times when I'm you know if you're talking to a woman down here she might ask you like after three or four exchanges of conversation you know going back and forth she might ask you if you're married what do you do for a living how much money you make things like that maybe not how much money you make but what do you do for a living so those things happen down here, and it's just different culture. Now there are people that that will never do that, but but I've encountered it from time to time, and maybe you could encounter that in the United States too. Maybe if someone is a foreigner that lives in the U.S., you might encounter some things because when you when you show up with an accent, it sort of inspires people to to ask questions. It kind of brings up this um this curiosity so it, it could be based on that you know not uh brazilians are very very nice people very nice um very resourceful hard workers and where i live i, I mean i'm always having people tell me that that it's difficult to find good mechanics good electricians Things like that. But in Maka A, every time I've needed an electrician, an automobile mechanic, um, some sort of mechanical work or something like something to that degree, it seems like it's a, a stone throw away very quick. But thanks for watching, and I'll catch up on the next episode about this. Thank you for joining me on this Brazilian adventure. If you enjoyed exploring Brazil with me, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to Lost in Brazil for more exciting content and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Share your thoughts and questions or suggestions in the comments below. I love hearing from you. And until next time, obrigado and safe travels.